Good afternoon, everyone, and really wonderful session since morning today. And before the lunch, a, such a powerful panel to discuss a very innovative, very futuristic topic on how you're going to use Gen AI to overcome your threats and how you're going to be resilient about it, right? I think uh, I have a very power-packed panel, and uh, I welcome all my panelists today uh, for this discussion. And just to set the stage running, we have already been seeing, you know, cybersecurity as one of the major concerns in the last couple of years. So many cyber attacks happening. Every three seconds, we see a ransomware attack happening. We have the cybersecurity postures. Each industry, each company has it. We still have the cyber attacks happening. We started coming up with the tra traditional AI to bring in, you know, generate the anti-malwares, your SOC solutions, your SEIM solutions, your EDR, your data classification. However, we were all, you know, trying to implement this kind of solutions of traditional AI, and we are now looking into the generative AI, right? And the difference between the traditional AI and the generative AI is it's all about new data, the real-time data when we are looking in. We don't have any archival information when we have as regards the traditional AI. It's really going to give us a lot of push, whether it's a behavior analysis, whether it's your log analysis, whether it's your threat uh, intelligence. That's what the Gen AI is all going to be giving us. And how we are really going to mitigate these threats is a challenge. It's a point of concern. And with the Gen AI, it's hacker versus hacker. AI versus AI, and now we are going to say Gen AI versus Gen AI. We are in that situation because hackers or the criminals are going to have the similar kind of tools and similar kind of mindset to attack you. You got to mitigate those threats in real time with that kind of efficiency and kind of, you know, the way you're going to look at your threat protection. So to start this panel, I will request each one of my panelists, I'll start from the right, and uh, one by one, I will request them to give their views on use of threat, uh, the Gen AI in threat mitigation, how do they look at it, how do they look at the operational resilience, and their views, I would like to request each one of them. So over to you, Shahilin. Thank you very much, and giving me this opportunity to share my views on, uh, on um, AI. Um, so uh, AI has, use of AI has been very important in the power industry, and a lot of business cases and cybersecurity cases have come up for the use and benefit of our consumers and improve the cybersecurity posture. Uh, we are looking forward for trying to implement, doing some POCs, on uh, utilizing the consumer data, how we can improve the services, and keeping um, the privacy data safe, and also securing our critical infrastructure, where we can get the real-time information on the threats, how we can how we can minimize the response time, and uh, faster closure of the incidents. Thank you, Shaleen. And I'll over to you, Akshay, uh, because we have a very diverse panel today working in different sectors. And Gen AI in cybersecurity is a major issue of discussion for all of them. So over to you, Akshay, for your views. Yeah, good afternoon, you all. <clears throat> so basically, our CJ brick and mortar company, you can say. So Gen, Gen AI, yes, that is the time has come you have to use it or you will be left behind. So somewhere or other you have to be, because the adversary is uh, Gen, as uh, rightly said, is Gen AI. So you have to have some sort of Gen AI to counter that. Now, to that extent, uh, what we are doing is we are first uh, uh, using Gen AI for some sort of must uh, have, uh, we have uh, developed one uh, Gen AI for our company, NTPC. We have our own internal Gen AI, that means uh, taking all information inside, it, it gives uh, some sort of uh, uh, information uh, for information system or help uh, system for uh, our uh, company usage. 
Now that is the starting point. At least you should understand what actually it is, and what uh, benefits or uh, this thing will will get. Now, in this uh, for cyber security, we are using products which are with Gen AI, and their updates, regular updates and upgrades. Actually, they are improving also. So that way, we can say we are using Gen AI, and it will get better as the products will get better because all security solutions are some way or other will be implementing this thing. Uh, that's all problem. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very interesting points which you highlighted. And over to you, uh, Sanjeev, for your views. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, good evening, everyone. Sorry, good afternoon, everyone. So for me, uh, Gen AI is nothing is basically a subset of the artificial intelligence as um, now companies are afraid to adopt the generative AI model because people see it is a challenging and it is uh, a risk for organizations also. But the similar feelings people have for in 90s when computer came into the picture, right? It will uh, eat the people's job and so and so. So people were fear to about adopting the uh, computers that time. So for me uh, to get rid of from ai if people are thinking that is not the best practice until unless if we are not adopting right now in near future people have to adapt that uh, because a lot of risk has been happened people has upload their secure code on the generative ai that's why a lot of people are not using or not adopting so the best way is to adopting the generative ai is uh, we should think about like it is an as an opportunity instead of that risk right we should create a proper governance framework to adopt the generative AI model for their particular organization, where we can increase our threat modeling, we can increase the fastest response to mitigate the incident plan. Similar way, like we are uh, uh, working on the ransomware playbooks uh, to mitigate the ransomware related risk, same way we should create a, a basically risk matter control for the generative AI and the user awareness, basically I would say, we have to uh, specifically mention in our uh, user awareness session, like we are awareing our people uh, about the phishing links and all people should take the, uh, check the um, spelling corrections, check the domain name. Similar way we should educate our employees how to adopt and how to be educate for the generative AI and what should be uh, take the precautions to using that. So that is my view about the generating AI. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks and uh, over to you Ravi. Sure. So um, I think my views about generative AI is like, I think it's an absolutely uh, fantastic, uh, I think, innovation in terms of technology. And uh, the way generative AI is different, as we see uh, from a different uh, or, or a traditional AI, as we say, or the broader AI, as we say, I think the uniqueness about this is that, you know, it creates, it generates the new content which never existed before. And because of this very unique nature and the quality of generative AI, which is based on the large language models, as we say LLM, mm -hmm. I mean, it adds a lot of value. It has got use cases for practically everyone. So earlier, I mean, I think as a, as a end user or as a, you know, uh, a person who is not in corporates, but even in their individual life, I think we did not use AI that much. At least we did not actively go and adopted an AI solution though whatever services, whatever I would say uh, e-services that we had been using on our personal note, they were making advancements in AI and we were a kind of forced or you would say privileged consumer of that. But when the, ge when, when the generative AI came in uh, and chat GPT is uh, the most popular example of it, I think that's where we saw how the industry or how the overall like I would say world uh, became receptive to that and got attracted to that uh, because of the very, you know, nature of it. I think it has got a lot of application in every industry wherever you have to create a new content, whether it is uh, multimedia, whether it is graphics, whether it is, you know, text. Uh, and in what field it doesn't have a usage, whether you go into production, whether you go into legal services, uh, I think editorial ship, I mean, everybody is using it. So this being a fantastic kind of innovation which is broadly consumed by every person on the earth and it has the potential but of course this like any other technology also has its own downsides and i think as we go deeper into it that while gen ai can help strengthen the cybersecurity program of an organization by way of various use cases that it can you know 
cater to, this itself, because of the underlying model, is subject to the security risk itself. So looking forward to a great discussion on this. Uh, thank you, Ravi. And over to you, Sanjeev, uh, Commander Sanjeev, for your views on the subject. Thank you, sir. Uh, when I look at Gen AI in uh, the context of an enterprise, uh, I have three very specific buckets in mind. And whatever I say is with the rider that this field itself is evolving so rapidly. Uh, so whatever I say could be wrong in about six months to one year time. Uh, who can imagine Chat GPT got launched just about 18 months back and where the world has moved since then. Uh, however, when I look at Gen AI, uh, and I'm from an IT company, I look at three distinct use cases. One is developers of Gen AI or Gen AI based solutions. That, that has its own risks. Uh, the second is the employees. And co-panelists talked about, say, use of tools like ChatGPT by employees, etc. Do you allow them? Do you not allow them? What are the risks? Uh, in our case, we have made a guideline uh, where we do allow a particular solution and then block everything else. And to our surprise, when we blocked everything else, we realized how many people were using those solutions. Uh, and the third aspect in the context of cybersecurity is the tools that we use, the EDRs, XDR, the SIMs of the world, they are starting to embed Gen AI based technologies or solutions in their tools. Uh, essentially to act as an assistant to whoever was using this tool, operating the tool. Uh, and that I think is a good use case. But going forward, we'll also have to think, right, if I'm doing 40 solutions and there are 40 Gen AI embedded in each of those solutions, how do I create a common context out of all this? So that has its own risks or usability challenges, I would say. Uh, and so when we talk about Gen AI, uh, it's not one big hole, but we have to talk about risks and usability across the different aspects. Yeah, thank you, Commander Sanjeev. And over to you, Jitender. Hi, thank you, Najit. <coughs> so I think uh, everybody knows AI and Gen AI nowadays. And I was talking to my co-panelists, I think, outside. Uh, when I first come to know my son is working in an organization uh, last year, and his appraisal was due. So I was asking him what I'm going to write. He says, chill, Dad. It has been done. I said, how did it? So he said, there's something called chat GPT. That's the first time I heard about chat GPT. Although I'm in IT industry for almost 34 years, which I've been there. And he mentioned to me that it has written my appraisal. I had given him the basically particulars and given my appraisal this thing. I said, OK, show me that. Of course, that's the first time that I got a practical experience of uh, having a Gen AI. Having said that, when we look at the Gen AI right now, or for that matter, what is the implication in the industry? Uh, what we have seen, uh, like in our in corporate, I come from Tata, we have got right now more than 100 projects. I'm not saying projects, the POC which are going on the, you know, AI, the various sides of the AI which are doing on the consumer side, customer side, internal employee, productivity improvements, other uh, initiative which are doing right now. One of the challenges which we see is that, uh, like being a large group, we have got a, uh, many organizations, they've got a separate departments. So how to monitor which is doing what? Because when you talk about Gen AI, it is talking about data. You're using a huge data which have been there. And then other side, we look at the compliance side. Okay, when we talk about Gen AI, you're using data which goes outside using LLM, and then data brings you, uh, you generate something new. It can be anything, miss audio, text, video, whatever you want to do, deepfakes, whatever we talk about. So how to use the data, that is one. And when the, we look at, uh, internally also, and you look externally, GDPR and the other data privacy laws and the compliance which have been there, how to comply to that. And as a responsible corporate, you need to basically look into that balance which have been there. So one of the challenges which uh, we see as of now within the our group or the organization, that first we need to know that who is using which tool, because AI is right now at the initial stage which we see that. A uh, lot of things are coming up, and that's how the, I think all technology evolved, kind of this thing which have been there. Uh, it's the hype cycle, which we know that thing. So how to manage it? Because we need to have a responsible AI, as we talk about. There should not be bias when we use the AI in our basically processes. So that is the challenge which you see. And that also translates into the cybersecurity when we try to protect our infrastructure or our assets for that matter. Because we work in the wide range of the industry, right from the you know, consumer industry to the defense to aerospace and all this industry. So I think it's a exciting time. On one hand, we got a technology which is going to uh, if it has been proven and if it has been basically successfully into production, it's going to change the way we are going to work uh, in future. 
uh, it is going to improve the basically efficiency of the organization it is going to improve the customer experience on one end but other side how we are going to comply to the other uh, compliance which are going to come nationally as well as internationally so thank you jitendra and what to you manmeet good afternoon so my co panelists have already discussed the <clears throat> the various use cases implications of uh, gen ai so i would hi like to highlight like but how to harness or implement or get output from that gen ai uh, is one of the challenges and for that you know my recommendation is at your organizations you have to build a simulation kind of lab or uh, if anybody has heard about digital twins <clears throat> so what we have done is whatever hardware whatever application or solution that is running i have got a, a simulated copy of or the digital twin what i say that gives me output i can measure the performance put cyber security into the same and get the uh, productive benefit from same for example we work for airports uh, there is a customer journey customer goes from various touch points from the airports goes to various e gates they have their facial recognitions and everything and uh, we have created a digital twin in which the same replica is simulated through a software and i keep on performing tests <coughs> simulations to improve the new things which are coming in the market so that is my recommendation is to implement the same generative ai please start setting up test labs and simulation labs and try exploring digital twin concept and you can go to a digital twin concept and search for it it will really help you to achieve success by use of generative ai thank you so thank you sanjeev and over to you manshu for your views on it uh, good afternoon everyone <clears throat> so i think uh, kanal saab all of us have actually spoken about the majority of portion which i prepared but i want to bring something interesting so it's like people thought that jene i will do my work and i will focus on my art and music and uh, i will write more songs i will uh, you know create more pictures now it's the other way around you know ai is actually doing my stuff it's writing my songs and writing uh, uh, you know creating my pictures and i am and we are here discussing about the cyber security you know newer sense that it may create uh, but uh, my fellow has actually brought in uh, quite an interesting aspect uh, we uh, at gmr also uh, part of the same industry and uh, you brought in the digital twin uh, perspective we are actually working on the digital twin so uh, bringing the miniaturized or a uh, you know limited or a uh, you know uh, smaller size digital uh, twin and try and uh, simulate those possibilities of what may go wrong and uh, uh, you know try and do that simulated attack uh, those you know possibilities what may go wrong and so on and so forth and try and test those uh, counter measures which we think that we have implemented and they may work uh, kanal sir with your permission can i do a small poll here sure all of us how many of us have actually blocked chat gpts in our office networks audience you can raise the hands is actually let's let's play it chat gpt very allowed hai ya nahi hai very important nahi hai wale haath uthaiye are bhai yahan allowed hai awesome <laughs> so so the point which i wanted to bring was uh, colonel saab and fellow so we still don't know there is a lot of things so uh, abhi uh, if with your due permission i'll take another minute i was talking to a friend and uh, he brought in a con uh, old story from panchatantra so hua kya tha ke there were four uh, char vidwan wo log jangal se ja rahe the and wahan pe sher ek mara hua sher ki body thi so teen vidwanon ne uh, socha ke unhone bola ke main isme jaan dal sakta hu main isko aur khunkhar bana sakta hu main isko uh, iska jo uh, you know iski jo फिजिकल केपेबिलिटीज हैं उसको और स्ट्रॉन्ग कर सकता हूँ चौथे वाले मानव आपने कहा कि वी डोंट नो वट मे गो रॉन्ग तो वो पेड़ पे चढ़ गया एंड में जो पेड़ पे चढ़ गया था वो बचा बिकॉज वो शेर को जिंदा कर दिया शेर इन दिनों को खा गया सो वी डोंट नो सर वी डोंट नो एंड फॉर दैट एग्जैक्ट मैटर आई थिंक द पॉइंट विच आर फ्रेंड ब्रॉट इन 
try and test as much as possible because हमारे यहाँ पे at least 30 percent लोगों ने हाथ उठाया जेन आई या चैट जीपीटी बंद है but hackers के side पे बंद नहीं है वो right they are the ones who are actually utilizing it they are ones who are actually utilizing it to the best of its possibilities क्या हो सकता है they don't really adversaries don't really have any policies to follow adversaries don't really have to uh, have any regulations to follow so that is exact uh, you know one of the uh, major concerns or cautions with which all of us have to really think about uh, how do we build those countermeasures uh, with respect to the uh, concept called Gen, Gen AI. Thank you, Imanchu, and I think you raise a very pertinent point whether blocking is going to really safeguard uh, you from not using it or how it's going to be because this technology is always going to stay. And Gen AI, when we talk of the, the base model, which is either LLM, large language models. They're already vulnerable to a lot of cyber attacks and cyber threats are there. And while everybody talks of data in real time, there's a bigger challenge of data poisoning which nobody talks of it, okay? And that's where in the Gen AI, if you have a data poisoned, your whole you know, models are going to go for a toss, right? So that's how the Gen AI, why we'll talk of, it's a good part of it. It's got all challenges and security threats which are already documented, lots of research which are happening. So I'd like to ask my uh, you know, panelist that what are the opportunities it's throwing you uh, from your organization perspective as to how you're going to use it for threat mitigation, right? When you're going to use Gen AI vis-a-vis -vis your traditional security or now we are talking of traditional AI-based cybersecurity solution. Over to you, Sharanji. So, uh when we talk about pertinent use of Gen AI to have a cyber resilience environment, we would be looking for continuous audits of the systems, number one, uh, where we can have continuous data, what systems are most vulnerable, because in power systems we have both IT and OT. <coughs> and uh, um, in, Number two is that we would be looking for real-time information about uh, the assets. Um, is there any zero, more about the zero-day attacks? Any change in the um, network, any change in the assets, or any vulnerabilities reported by any of the OEMs in IT or OT? So that would be great help. Number three, we would be looking forward for um, a quick resolution on the incidents. How fast we can detect and how fast we can um, resolve the incidents. How we can utilize the existing data to create a scenario, like we have deep fakes, a lot of videos are being, uh, or uh, movies and pictures are being made. How we can utilize the existing data and create more scenarios for phishing, awareness, and training of people, existing people, to improvise and create an awareness about how to uh, build a more resilient environment. Yeah, thank you, I think you brought in very good points. And over to you, Akshay, as to how are you trying to put in the Gen AI for threat mitigation <coughs> and resilience? Yeah. Uh, yeah, this thing, is Gen, Gen AI will certainly help in assisting for detection, protection, and uh, restoration. That means resilience. Uh, but uh, our, uh, what our concern basically is, wh what is our way of uh, thinking of this is, you Gen AI, because this will give external intelligence. See, you are, we are not, whatever data it is using anyway for training is there. Plus, you are getting the complete intelligence from outside because that will, uh, that product, whatever you are using, will be using uh, data across the world or from your OEM, uh, everything uh, training. So that means we are getting, uh, just like we are getting uh, alerts or IOC from various agencies, those things will be built in in this Gen AI and that will help uh, faster detection and the remediation also will be uh, uh, easier steps, playbooks and all will be easier. However, I particularly, uh, we are not in favor of having it in autopilot mode anyway because there should be some personal malware intervention must be there 
So we uh, make it a point not to put uh, anything on autopilot mode like a playbook and all. We still have manual intervention. We do manual intervention in this because that uh, helps for dual purpose. One thing is our people are kept involved because they should know what actually is happening. If you put something playbook, make a playbook with Gen AI and all these things, and you think everything is working fine, probably working fine. But are you sure you are, it is working fine? Because there must be human element uh, involved. Plus basic, basic hygiene. Of course, it will help detection on basic hygiene level also because there will be products, there are products, they can scan through your uh, uh, infra and they will tell these are the vulnerability, these are the needs patches, these are uh, needs, and that way it will help. Basic hygiene and basic uh, uh, help in detection, protection, and those things. So that is our uh, concept. That, that's what I feel uh, we will be doing. Thank, Thank you. you. You highlighted very important points of, you know, IOCs, threat uh, analysis, and uh, real-time monitoring the data. And over to you, uh, Manmeet. So, <coughs> for us, honestly speaking, we have not uh, fully implemented Gen AI uh, as a practice because we are in the adoption phase. So, uh, we have emphasized uh, basically to more on our basics, to strong our basics. If my basics are strong, uh, whether Gen AI come or any other new technology come, I think we will be uh, less exposed. That is what I feel. And uh, definitely Gen AI, what so far we have adopted, it is we are helping us to create our threat intel, more intelligence way. Uh, incident response uh, is faster. False positive, we are uh, able to recognize in a very faster manner. So these are the use cases which we have tested yet uh, on the Gen AI side. Okay, thank you, Manmeet. And over to you, Ravi. Sure. Uh, so I think <clears throat> the use of Gen AI from an end-user industry perspective, I think uh, the most important that I find is as it generates the new content, I think phishing simulations can be, you know, kind of leveraged with the content that it develops. Uh, that's one part. Uh, the second part is if you go into the adversary kind of, you know, uh, attack simulations uh, using the ANN models, uh, which is not chat. Uh, generative AI, but using the ANN models, you can definitely have scenarios, new scenarios built as to, you know, how an adversary can have attacks and then there can be various, uh, I would say, scenarios or variations of that. That is something, again, where generative AI or uh, the ANN uh, technologies can be used. Uh, apart from that, uh, think of like a learning module that you want to create. Uh, I'm not sure how, I mean, automated would it be, but definitely this is one area that we have started exploring, that you give it a topic, you give it certain key pointers, and it can generate the images, it can generate the animated videos for you, which you can use for your training purposes, for your awareness purposes in your organization. Now, this is all from an end user uh, industry uh, consumption perspective, but if you go to the OEM side, uh, I think I was attending to one of the OEM uh, product demo, and I think how they have made use of the generative AI is that while the platform has got all the incident and event related data, all the, you know, uh, vector directions, how the attack traversed and everything, uh, I think it also had a provision of giving you a prompt as to if you ask the system that can you write a small incident summary or an incident report for this in 100 words. I think that's what is something very useful because at the end of the day, when you have to translate this entire incident into some management reporting, I think that's where you will probably spend at least half an hour to understand as to what really happened. You will talk to the analyst and you will convert into a management language. I think all this is something, you know, which if it can be automated, the moment an incident is closed or it is halfway, I mean, this is like a great use case of a generative AI in terms of generating a new report for you. So, I mean, there are like numerous uh, use cases that you can go through uh, and definitely, I mean, this is one technology which is helping in many ways. Thank you very much. And, you know, with the Gen AI coming in, the barrier, barrier of entry as a hacker has been reduced. Very easy to write a code, very easy to create a, uh, you know, vulnerability and check the vulnerability in any, in any network and launch an attack. So it doesn't really require any big technology knowledge or coding knowledge to be a hacker now. So that's what is the problem which is going to be and very uh, pertinent points of IOCs, your you know, inline data monitoring, 
your threat intelligence, anomaly detection, those are the very important points from an implementation opportunity perspective. Now, I will talk on the challenges which are there uh, on, on this side of my panel. Let me, let me put this because every technology has got a challenges as well. So, what are the challenges which you feel if you're implementing the Gen AI uh, in the organization? So, over to you, Commander Sanjeev. Thank you, sir. Uh, but I would just start with uh, referencing two studies. About five, six months back, there was a study from IBM Expo Threat Intel, uh, where one of the analysis in that was they have not seen attackers leveraging Gen AI for attacks yet. Of course, it will happen in future. Uh, but there is no ROI for attackers yet. The second study was by Microsoft, released about a month ago, uh, where they experienced very similar things. Where they say there is no incentive for attackers to attack Gen AI or leverage Gen AI for attacking. Yes, they are using Gen AI for getting better, just like as defenders are using Gen AI to get better, uh, which is to write better social engineering content, bit of coding, etc. But they are still doing the same things what they used to do as man uh, hands on keyboard. Uh, and so for us as defenders, nothing much changes. If you already have phishing protection, code protection, and various kinds of protection that we typically have, yes, attackers get better, 100%, but there is no new technique that has yet come out. So from a challenges perspective, uh, if I can point to, so MITRE has released a new framework called ATLAS, A-T-L-A-S. It's an excellent framework where you can go and look at threats, the tactics and techniques uh, leveraging Gen AI. Now, if you look at that framework, you'd realize except for one tactic, all others are practically part of the MITRE attack framework, which is the traditional IT, traditional enterprise. So that also suggests there's nothing new that we have to do. Yes, there are attacks on Gen AI itself, the LLMs, uh, but that's mostly for the developers, those who are developing solutions based on AI. As consumers, for us, nothing much changes. From a challenge perspective, I would say this. If you're doing good cyber hygiene, and which still goes back to traditional stuff like patching, vulnerability reduction, removing misconfigurations, patching applications, etc., etc., and identity security, I think for now and for the very near future, we are still good enough. Uh, but, of course, the things will change in future and when we start having autonomous AI doing bad stuff to us. We are already seeing that trend from LLMs, we are moving to SLMs, small language models. And I think when we probably go to the micro LMs, that is when we will have a real threat uh, to our organizations. Yeah, thank you. Very, very important points. What do you, Dr. Jitinder? Yeah, thank you. <coughs> so, uh, I think uh, Commander Sanjeev has very rightly enumerated what challenges which we, we don't see much challenge from the outside. What I want to discuss about is that we see a lot of usage, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, of AI POCs or the projects within the organization which we see that. Uh, we work heavily with the defense and uh, we use Gen AI in a very interesting fashion. We do a lot of POC with the defense, you know. Uh, normally, I think we've got the defense people here. Any projects go, it takes some years to do that and you need to generate a lot of basically POCs. And for the software development, we use Gen AI right now to have the code generation. It is not in the production, just to see the proof of concept, and then we are using those kind of stuffs which are there. Uh, second is what we see is basically a lot of, uh, in some areas where we are looking at the employee efficiency, or we are looking at the customer interface, we are doing some experiments, as I mentioned earlier. So the challenges which we face is, end of the day, uh, when we talk about AI, it is based on the data. So we need to have a large data which will be there. And the data is to be hosted somewhere. The data is to be captured from somewhere. somewhere and the new data is getting generated. So the underline is the data when we talk about data analytics or that uh, data lake which we are talking about. So, and the other side, I think, as I mentioned earlier also, there's the compliance. So how to have the balance between that? That is one. Second is the bias. Uh, when we look at uh, in the normal automation or the normal AI practice which have been there, uh, we have the basically data cleansing process in place where we had some control in this. And there's a transparency when we look at this traditional AI, because we understand the algorithm which are going to do that. In the Gen AI, when we talk about, uh, of course, it is in the experimental phase. It is not as of now into production for some of the areas, most of the areas which you talk about. There is very less transparency what the, because it generates code by itself, and it is basically working. Uh, we do not understand there's less, less transparency in the how the logic has been done, how the algorithm has been done, which have been there. 
I think that is another challenge which we face right now. Uh, I'm not so facing which uh, try to address those issues which have been there. And of course, the bias which you see in the data, okay? Uh, if you put the data in a certain way, uh, so it also generates the bias according to that. And we do not have a control which way it will go kind of thing. So these are initial things which we see right now in our organization, uh, with the challenges when we look at that. And of course, the, on the other side, when we look at the product side, I think there are a lot of product company and the OEMs which are working on the AI, it is still to mature. I think there is still, a, uh, when you talk about the, what the accuracy of these models is still evolving, I am saying evolving. There are various percentage which we see from 70 to 80 to 85 percent which have been there. So keeping in that mind, I think uh, when we put, uh, going to the production, it will still take some time. I'm not saying what time is there because technology adoption nobody can predict right now, but I think this is a challenge which you see as of now in the environment. Yeah, thanks, and over to you, Sanjeev. See, I'll take the operational resilience part, you know, you know and uh, though we have uh, generative AI technologies, algorithms and everything, uh, in terms of operational resilience, the only way I can test my resilience is like how much punches or beatings I can take on a system or a server on an application that it does not <coughs> become non, it, uh, it is out of function. And to do that, you know, we require a load testing capability to be developed at the organization. And to get the load testing done, uh, you know, there should be a lot of involvement of people from business, from developers, from uh, consumers, and all of the people who should provide you like, you know, uh, data in terms of, you know, what is the data they are trying to ingest or put in the application. So breaking the application and getting result in terms of how I can withstand that load is one of the challenges uh, that is still in, uh, you know, deployment. And the other aspect is uh, the, the lure of, you know, getting more and more by people. For example, uh, I just gave this example to uh, different, different people. Example of Blinkit, you know, you want to get your, you know, food or your order within 10 minutes. And by that way, you provide your home address, your biographics and everything. Similarly, somebody lures you that while you are traveling, you know, your wife or your kid can get a additional off or a, a reward, like free stay for two days, three days. So what people do is that, again, try to put the entire family details into their applications and other things. <clears throat> So we are only increasing our threat landscape day by day, though Gen AI is trying to help us, but we, are, we should, you know, reduce that information or the exposure of that information also. So, and that is becoming a challenge because everybody wants more and more and they provide more and more information every day. You delete five information, five profiles from one place, you add 10 more profiles, 10 more data elements at some other place. So that should be done in a controlled way. Otherwise, Gen AI capabilities, if used by, say, hackers or other people who are malicious, you know, they will one day have more and more biographics and information of yours, and you become more vulnerable in future. So that consideration should be taken into place. Uh, thank you, and over to you, Himanshu. I actually want to bring the perspective of the convergence. Uh, I think many of us are part of the uh, critical infrastructure. And uh, when we talk about the IT and OT convergence and for the challenges perspective to uh, the Gen AI and the cyber attacks and so on and so forth, uh, predominantly the OT side of it, the industrial control side of it is, uh, uh, is something which has been running on legacy systems. And those legacy systems, like the way Sanjeev was mentioning about, how much load can it take? Because ultimately, when you talk about the capabilities of Gen AI, you need resources, right, to tackle those attacks and so on and so forth. While one side of it is quite matured, while we are still maturing, the other side of it, uh, the core industrial control and the OT part of it, it's still running on a lot of legacy. Uh, and that's the sad reality. 
while we all want data, right? Everybody wants data. Everybody wants uh, uh, the way uh, 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 Sir was explaining about it that we need the vitals of all the components on our mobile phones. Uh, that's helping us. But then uh, on the on the flip side, that actually can uh, bring down my system in a jiffy by uh, utilizing or maybe you know over utilizing the resources and everything and bringing uh, the scale of possibilities of uh, tackling those kind of new age attacks on that side of the uh, uh, of the infrastructure is quite uh, it, it requires a lot of investment so that is one part where uh, enterprises uh, the defense establishments a lot of critical infrastructure has to really think about it Thank you. And uh, before we close the session, any questions from the audience? Yeah. You can take, I think. Uh, I can speak. Yeah, yeah. Or louder, that's better. So anyone uh, wants to take it on here? So bug bounties have always been there. The way uh, one of our fellow panelists, sir, was mentioning about, I think, basic hygiene. It has always been there. Bug bounties starting from the era of uh, the CCNAs and the MCSEs. And when the Facebook started and a lot of these new age organizations started, a lot of uh, youngsters, a lot of people who had a lot of interest in this identified bugs. And it still happens, right? So hackathon is something uh, uh, a part of this kind of collaborative effort, what are we doing? We are actually discussing the problems. Hackathon is nothing but a technical uh, discussion of it. Okay, there is a pro potential problem. Try and get into it. Try and solve it. So yes, definitely. But uh, if you look at the adversary side of it, hackathons are also uh, uh, you know, bound by certain rules and regulations and so on and so forth. You have limited resources. You can't go overwhelmed uh, by, you know, you can do anything and everything. But on the other side, uh, you have access to anything and everything and you're not really bound by the regulations and the rules and so on and so forth. So definitely it, it helps and it is definitely uh, helping. A uh, lot of uh, institutions uh, are actually doing, conducting these uh, hackathons. We are also uh, you know, put, conducting such trainings uh, on the digital lab and so on and so forth. But what is it it's doing? It's doing, it's helping us uh, create that ecosystem. Uh, the layer which we really need uh, to protect the critical infrastructure. So, short answer is yes. Anybody else? We're just between the lunch and the last question, if anybody wants to ask. If none, so I will... Anyone? Okay. So, thank you, all the panelists, for uh, a wonderful insights. And I think this is one of the key takeaways as to how you're going to implement the Gen AI for threat mitigation, what should, you, uh, what should you have as a cybersecurity solutions into your organization? What are the best use cases available? What it brings on the table? What are the kind of frameworks which you need to understand? How you can use it effectively? I think we discussed all those points and a lot of takeaways for you to implement in your respective organization because all the panelists were from uh, the power sector, the energy exchanges, from uh, Tata Advance, for the Bill of I think phenomenal discussions what we had and I thank each one of you for a wonderful discussion and also all the, all the attendees for attending before the lunch. Thank you very much and have a great day.